Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Princeton Reviews webinar, Medical Admissions Timeline for 2019-2020 Application Cycles. Thank you for joining us today, and I'm here with our resident expert, Anita, to bring you important information about the med school admissions process. Before we begin, I'd just like to review a few housekeeping keeping items. Um, first, everyone's microphones are set to mute. So if you have questions, please use the questions panel and type your questions in the box. Um, we'll either answer them as we can throughout the webinar or save them for the end during our Q&A session. With that, I'll pass it over to Anita to get started. Hey guys, can you believe it that we're actually in November talking about the 2019-2020 application cycle? Um, for those of you who may be getting ready to apply, you, you're probably thinking, why do I have to think about this now? And I'm really, really going to explain the importance of that in just a minute. So to give you some idea how, why, what we're going on here, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So first of all, I go by Anita. Uh, my name is Dr. Anita Pascal. I have an MD. I actually also have two PhDs. Um, so I should have, I got lots of letters dangling off behind my name, but I've been doing this for over 17 years, actually almost 20 years now. I'm like a dinosaur. Um, I have counseled thousands, um, over 10,000 applicants now. Um, I ran a health professions advising program. I've been running this program here at the Princeton Review, mentoring kids just like yourself for over three years now. I received my medical degree from Chapel Hill. My background is family medicine and reproductive health and family planning. I actually worked for the World Health Organization for quite a few years. I have a master's degree in education. And like I said, I have a PhD in physiology and pharmacology. Guys, do not be impressed. I did not want to get a job. Um, but I am very, very well connected in the medical school community. And so I want to share with you guys today some reflections on what we do on the admissions side. Um, having worked with now over five specific MD programs and two osteopathic programs as well as run a health professions um, program at the undergraduate level, I really have a strong sense of not only what we're looking for, but what we're not looking for. So basically, we're going to be talking just about an overview of med admissions, what we're looking for, giving you some advice and some timing, and then giving you some insight on how we can help you get there. So before I get started, so I have just some idea of who all I'm talking to today. If you could do me a favor and just answer the following poll, launch the poll, then you could actually answer it and click on to let me know, have you already applied? Um, are you applying in this upcoming cycle, which would be 2019, 2020? Um, or are you planning to apply in the future? Oh, this is great. So I've got a really good target audience. That means a lot of you guys, um, about 90% are getting ready to apply. A few of you folks have already applied, which leads me to think part of what you're looking at. Am I, you know, what if I don't get in this year? Why would I maybe not have gotten in? So we're really going to talk to you about all all of those perspectives. Okay, so what does it take to get into med school? So I'm going to break this down. We're going to talk about the numbers and then we're going to talk about the other parts. So what you need to understand is there are tens of thousands of applicants applying. Okay, so if you figure that the average medical school is going to get anywhere from 7,000 to 17,000 applications, they're not picking them up as a piece of paper and looking at each individual um, algorithm. What they are doing is an electronic pre-screen. Those pre-screens are typically on your GPA and your test score. So we're going to talk globally about what your screening parameters should be. But then once you get through that screen, what are the other things we're looking for? How much do we weight those? And how do we look at those? Okay. So the first part, if you look at this slide, and honestly, in my part, this is a little bit deceiving because they say 816,000 applications. What that means is of the 51, almost 52,000 applicants last year, and this was actually down, and I'll show you this um, just a few minutes ago, um, in a few minutes, but this is down from about 53,000 two years ago, but we're actually seeing a trend on applications. So we think we're probably going to be close to 53 to 54,000 this year. But if you're looking at this, and my pointer has completely disappeared. Don't y'all hate it when that happens? Um, but if you're figuring that the 
there are about 51 to 54,000 applicants every year. The average person submits about 16 applications and there are gonna be about 21,000 matriculates. So if you're looking, what we're seeing is historically the numbers, what are the screening parameters have continued to rise. So when we talk about screening parameters, we're always talking about that all important MCAT and your GPA. So I've broken this down to look at applicants versus matriculates, okay? So those who actually apply versus those who actually get in. And this is what we've been looking at over the past 10, 10 to 11 years. So if you look, our numbers have continued to go up except for this little blip that we had last year. Um, and we're also seeing an increase in the scores that we are looking for. So if you look at this, you can see that the average applicant has an MCAT score of around 500 to 501, which is about the 50th percentile on the MCAT, which we'll look at in just a minute. And they have a mean GPA of about 3.55, okay? But if you look at the numbers of the people who get in, you're looking more at what we talked about. And we used to say that you were shooting for that threshold of about 508 to 509, which puts you in about the 80th percentile. And last year we saw yet again that number creep up to about 510, which puts you in about about uh, the 80 plus percentile. Um, again, we're looking at the um, accepted GPA is closer to 3.7. So when we say that range, we say generally 3.65 to 3.75. Um, if you're looking at the numbers, here is really the number that you want to look at. You want to look at the fact that about 40 to 42 percent of the people who apply actually matriculate. And that's our biggest issue. Um, of everyone who applies, less than 50 percent are going to get in. So how do you distinguish the, yourself? So the first thing is being really realistic about where your screening parameters are. Now, I want to show you one other thing that we're looking at. Um, if you're looking at the number of people who applied versus the people who get in, this is kind of an interesting little stat, and it's, it, there's not a huge difference here, but the average age of the applicant applying to medical school is roughly about 25. It's 24 to 26, so we'll split the difference and say 25. Um, of those who apply, more males apply, just slightly more, about 51 to 49 percent. More females are accepted, about 51 percent to 49%, but when you look at the number of matriculates, it's pretty much straight on. The other interesting fact is looking at the numbers of out-of-state versus in-state applications, but you've also got to think of this globally. In-state, you may only have two to four schools in state. So to increase your chances if you're applying to 16, then a lot more people are going to apply out of state. But if you look at the number of matriculates, there's going to be a much higher um, rate of matriculation into an in-state school. And there are lots of reasons about that, which are pretty obvious. I mean, if you think about the fact that um, in-state, state-supported schools are sort of, by our regulations, required to take more in-state students. You've got an increased likelihood, and those tuitions tend to be lower. So if you're looking at where you want to be, a lot of people want to stay closer to home. So more apply out of state, but more matriculate in-state. Again, that's more just a virtue of the number of schools that are out there. Um, we will talk today about osteopathic programs, and this is a great route. A lot of people go, no, I want to be an MD. I don't want to be a DO. And I found that that comes a lot more out of ignorance. Now, granted, I have an MD, but I went to med school many, many years ago. Since that time, there are many more osteopathic programs, and they have become such a standout in, in the medical community. The other thing to be aware of is starting next year, all residency programs will be open to MD and DO applicants. In the past, osteopathic graduates had to apply to osteopathic residencies. Now, residency programs will be open to both types of applicants. And the, the training is exactly the same in terms of the science-based curriculum and your clinical, but then you get the added benefits of the overview of the holistic patient and the MMA, all of the, the manipulative components. So I always say it's like all of the training of an MD plus a whole additional bag of tricks. So I would encourage all of you to look at the information about osteopathic programs. As a general rule, in 2017, 2018, we saw the average um, osteopathic applicant applied to about nine programs. 
the mean um, MCAT for applicants was very similar to what we see to MD programs, but if you look at matriculates, that is significantly lower. That doesn't mean they don't have as bright a people in their programs. They have equally bright um, people in their programs. They just do not put as much emphasis on the MCAT. The mean GPA is a, only slightly lower than MD programs at about a 3.5, but it's a great option if you run into components of where you may not um, have that MCAT score that's quite where you need it to be. Um, moving on. So I need you to think about getting into med school is like going from college athletics to getting into the pros. There was a stat that said that of 10,000 high school applicants, um, high school, high school athletes, only about one out of 10,000 will ever get to the pros. If they're a college um, athlete, you're really only looking at maybe about five to 10 out of every 500. And so there, it is a much higher threshold. So most of you guys have strong GPAs that are three, two, three, four, three, five and above. You've done all of these types of activities. So to most people, people are looking at you going, wow, you're so talented. Just like when I used to play pickup ball in the, the gym with some of the female basketball players from NC State. Now let's just forget the fact that I'm five feet tall, but they ran circles around me because the talent level as a college athlete was so much stronger than what I had. It's the same thing. People look at you guys like that college athlete, but very few of those people will make it to the pros. So you've got to find the things that if you get that audition for the pros that are going to make you stand out. So let's talk first about the timeline. Why am I even having this conversation in November when you're not applying until June 1st or whenever the application cycle opens this year? They haven't announced for 2019, but somewhere between the last week of May and the first week of June. Well, the biggest aspect of this is that you want to look at between now and January, you should begin drafting your personal statement. And we're gonna talk more about that in a few minutes, but it really takes a good six to seven months to put together a strong application dossier. Now, you should have already completed many of the activities you need, and at this point, you should be tidying things up. So as we go through the things today, I want you to really think about whoa, have I done those things? Am I at the point of where I need to be to be putting my application together? And when we talk about your experiences, I'll tell you a way that you can think about that. But between now and January, you should start brainstorming your personal statement. As a general rule, what I tell my students is I want the first draft of their personal statement and their experiences, all 15 of their experiences, or if Texas, their, their total number of experiences or whatever, I want those first drafts by February. I want a second draft by March, and I want the final version sometime in April. It is critical that we get those so that come May, we are spending that time inputting your application so that as soon as you're, ready, you're able, you can hit the submit button. ACOMAS, the osteopathic program in Texas, both open in May. So again, you want that information completed so you can submit as soon as possible. Okay, and then you can use use June to start pre-writing for some of your secondaries. I'm going to talk about that in a second. So February, March, and April will be for revising your personal statement and your experiences. Also, by January, you should start have requested your letters of recommendation. You need to find out if your university has a committee that will allow you to gather letters through them. If not, you want to think about potentially using a letter service like Interfolio, and I don't getting kickbacks from them, but a place where people can write your letters in confidentiality and you can place them. And then you can transfer them from that service to your application services. Some of the biggest mistakes that I see students make is that they wait until like April or they finished a class to start asking for letters. Well, their professors come summer break are piecing out. Now you don't have to have all of your letters complete to submit your application, but a lot of schools will not finalize your application until all your letters are in. So I say a good rule of thumb is to start asking in January, give them an April 30th deadline so they can be really late and submit them by May or June. So thinking about your personal statement now, drafting it, I've got all types of tips for thinking about how to draft your personal statement. Um, 
I do need to give you guys some feedback before we go any further. Um, I have students who get obsessed with several things. The first is their GPA and their MCAT. Those are important, okay? Because that's what's gonna get you through the screen. So you've gotta be realistic about that. And I, I get this all the time. I get the great student with a 3-2 GPA who's like, but I've done so many wonderful things and I want it so badly. And I really, really get that. OK, but if you're in a sea of 10,000 people, if you're 10,000 applicants or 10,000 football players vying for that one spot on that football team, it's great that you may have a lot of talent. But if they, you get outrun or if you can't catch or if you're not there, you're not going to get that nod. So you've got to be realistic about your chances of getting in. And I get lots of students who say, but I really want the schools to just know that I'm interested. And the problem is. Everybody wants that, but you need to understand that if you put your application in and you don't have the metrics that you need, not the MCAT or the GPA, to a school, you look like you're uninformed. And if you get denied, then you become a reapplicant. And one of the trends that we're seeing among med schools is more and more med schools are saying they will not look at an applicant the first year after they have been denied because they're expecting them to go back and to do more and to complete more. So these are all really important self-check things that you guys need to do. By the way, if you get an opportunity, you can go to our admissions website and um, our admissions counseling website. And we actually have a little quiz on our website and you can check that. And it's like a self-check quiz that'll give you feedback on where you stand. So you've got to get through those screening parameters, but then everybody puts all this focus on their personal statement. I need you to understand that when we review an application at the admissions committee level, we may spend anywhere from two to three and a half, four minutes reviewing a complete application. So it should give you some idea that we're scanning your personal statement and we're also scanning your experiences. And your experiences can hold a lot more weight than your personal statement, because they also go through an electronic screen. And when we talk about experiences, I'll show you why that's important. So again, if you're looking for where you should be, everything should be finalized by the first part of May. When the application opens, you need to get your transcript submitted and start submitting your application. You submit your primary in June. The sooner, the better. I get lots of students who go, I was waiting on my MCAT score. You can submit without an MCAT score. If you have a score that's coming later, sometimes I encourage students to submit their application to a really rich school, a school that they have no intention of attending so that AMCAS can verify their application, get their score back, and then add their other schools. Because here's something you need to know. You are considered a reapplicant to any school that you submit your primary to if you are not accepted. If you only submit to one really rich school and you get a score and you decide to sit out this year, then you're only a reapplicant to that school if you reapply the next year. So it's really, that's part of what we're here for, not just to give you advice on how to write your personal statement or your experiences, but much more the advice of the who, what, when, how you get there. Now, we often say that if you get submitted in June, you want to use June to start pre-writing some of your secondaries. And here's another big mistake that students make. I hear all the time, where do you wanna to go to med school? And all I get is any place that will take me which really frustrates me because it's a huge investment and it's your education. And the other thing you need to think about is if you apply for every one school you apply to, about 85% of schools now automatically generate secondaries because it's all about cash. There's no guarantee they will be even looked at or opened. You just will receive them. The average school second sends three to five essays on their secondary. So let's say you say, I'm gonna apply to, I wanna try a lot of schools. I'm gonna apply to 30 schools. Okay, you apply to 30 schools. Let's say you get secondaries from 25 of those with four essays a piece. You could very quickly be looking at writing over 100 essays in a two to three week span in July, because we recommend that you try to get your secondaries back by August when schools really start to review them. So you need to be very, realistic about what you can handle and burn out. The other thing is never ever apply to a school that if it's the only school you get into, you would not go. And the reason for that is if you get accepted and you go, hmm, 
I'm, I, I really don't want to go to that school. I think I want to try and reapply next year. That's like the kiss of death because on the med school admissions committee side, we see that that's like painting a big scarlet letter A on the front of you because it's basically saying to us, you were not realistic about what you were doing. So be very careful in your selections. The last point before we go on, this is a year long process. I'm at the point right now with so many of my applicants who are like, oh my goodness, it's October, it's November, I haven't heard anything. And I was like, interviews just started two months ago. You've got to keep it in perspective. A school's gonna get 10,000 applications to maybe do 400 interviews. 400 interviews, wrap your head around that. How long it would take to do that? How long it takes to get through all of those? You need to understand that acceptances can come anywhere from October 15th all the way up through April 30th and beyond. It is very much a waiting game. We often say on a good year, you submit 20 applications to get 18 secondaries, to get five interviews for one acceptance. This is very different from college. So really, really think about that. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. The first is your primary application um, needs to, you figure that time frame of now through, through June. Secondary applications, July, August, September, in that time frame. Interviews start, if they're DO schools, sometimes in July, but most med schools interviews start August and September, and they run through January, February, some into March. Um, but the earlier, the better, because most schools, not all schools, but most schools do rolling admissions. You need to think about it. You all really, really want to get in. You all really, really want to be that first person in, but think about it like a preview of a, um, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize to you guys in the background. I have three dogs and you will hear my dogs barking. And if I get a delivery, you will hear them barking in the background. So my apologies, we will just keep rolling. Um, when we talk about rolling admissions, think about wanting to see the new Star Wars film. You guys all want to get it. But if you show up Five minutes before Star Wars starts, it doesn't matter if you have the correct payment to get into the movies. There may not be any seats left. That's the same way with rolling admissions. So screening parameters. We've already talked about this. The average GPA, admitting GPA is 365 to 375. The average applicant is 34 to 35. But keep in mind where your GPA is. Same thing for the average admitting MCAT score. It was 508, 509. We saw last year it was 510. OK, so again, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've talked about it. But if you're considering that if your GPA is around, you know, the, the minimum requirements are about three, three and above, you really need to be realistic because if they're trying to match you up with somebody who's got a higher GPA or a higher MCAT, you're going to be fighting against that. The other problem I see is kids get so focused on their GPA and their test score that they miss the other parameters. Clinical experience and service are going to be huge components of that. And I'm amazed at the number of kids who come to me with beautiful MCAT scores and great GPAs with 10 hours of clinical shadowing. And I get that you've done the metrics, but you are so much better to take a gap year and gap years are becoming more and more popular to get the other credentials that you need to spend that time to get in on your first shot to the type of school that you want to get to. If your credentials are a little bit lower, below that three, four, three, whatever, you really want to figure out, would you be willing to look at osteopathic programs? Would you be willing to take a gap year and maybe add a one-year master's to increase your science? Retaking your MCAT and reapplying, being a stronger candidate. And there are other options to look at. Look at podiatry school, consider a Caribbean program, fantastic options for students. Okay, so another thing to remember is that a strong MCAT score can help a slightly lower GPA, but a poor MCAT score kills the strongest GPA. So you may have a 4.0 GPA, but if you get a really subpar MCAT, really, really be focused on considering retaking that. 
When should you take your MCAT? This is something else. I get a lot of students who go, I just wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. I pushed it off. I pushed it off. I pushed it off. And they'll push it off into July. They'll push it off into August. Well, remember, a lot of schools won't mark you as complete until they get that score. On our side, we're saying you knew this was coming. Why did you not prepare? So your goal ideally should be to do your first test no later than the spring prior to when you want to apply. The 2019 dates are already open. Here's a listing of when those dates are. But ideally, you would want to test between January and April. So you have a score back prior to submitting your application. So you know what you're submitting with. Again, we've said maybe if you take in later May and you know your score's coming in June, submit to one of those REACH schools and wait for your score to come in so your application gets verified by MCAS. You can add schools anytime you want to. You can add and change MCAT dates. You can add an additional date, but you've got to have that initial score. But if you push it further out there, then you're going to really run the risk of not having an ability to retest. We often tell students to take their first test, wait um, 48 hours and sign up for a retest date in case they need it. Give themselves a couple of weeks off to kind of brush themselves off, get out of the MCAT study mantra, and then focus again, just like you were gonna study if you were going to take it for the first time. If you don't need that test date, that's gonna be the best deposit you ever lost. We all know that you're looking at this MCAT breakdown. It's broken into four categories. Base score runs anywhere from 472 to 528 is your top score. And it is a, a, almost a six and a half hour exam, uh, about eight hours with breaks. But that's the biggest point I want to make to you guys. I'm also amazed at the number of students who will spend months and months and months and months studying content to have only taken two or three practice tests. And guys, I get it, okay? That test is long. It is painful. None of us want to retake it, but it is a test of endurance and you have to train for it. And training is not just reviewing the questions. Training is practice test, building yourself up to it. You need to think about the MCAT just like you were training for a marathon. You do not get up this morning and go, I'm gonna go run 26 miles. It doesn't happen. You're gonna crash and burn. It is the same type of endurance. You need to do practice test, practice test, practice test. And that means repeating them over and over as much as you can. As we know, when we talk about the MCAT scoring, we've said that the 50th percentile of the average is around 500 to 501. We are looking for something, and this, this actually shows a little bit better. I actually prefer this chart. If you are looking at the um, scoring percentages, we are looking for a 509 to a 510. And when you wrap your head around that, that's pretty astounding. That's 80 to 82nd percentile of everybody who takes that test. You need to be prepared. You need to be realistic. I get kids all the time who go, and we ask, what are you shooting for? And they say 518. And I'm going, that's impressive. That's the 97th percentile. Only 3% of the people in the country would have scored higher than you. But I'm going to tell you, MCAT, like I said, is not the make or break of it all. I have several reapplicants right now that I'm working with who had almost 4.0 GPAs and anywhere from a 5.18 to a 5.22 who were denied last year. The two main reasons they were denied, they didn't package their application correctly and they didn't have the things that they needed in addition to those screening parameters. And I will tell you, uh, all of my reapplicants who had those issues are already accepted this year. And I didn't sprinkle fairy dust on them. I didn't make anything. To, I repackaged the way we present them, which is going to be what we are going to talk about now. Know what it takes. Outside of your personal statement, what experiences are you bringing to the table? Now, so for AMCAS, you get to list 15 experiences, three of which will be your most meaningful. I encourage all of you guys to go to the AMCAS website and look at the 15 core competencies. They do not match 15 experiences to core competencies. But in your experiences, oftentimes in two of the committees that I work on, we literally sit down and match the core competencies with the experiences that people have done. So again, start Starting now, first thing I would tell you, sit down and list out based on the categories I'm going to give you everything you've done in those areas. If you're struggling to come up with 15, 
you may not be ready. If you've got 20 or 30 and you've got to group them together, hot diggity, let's go with it. But part of it is you need to understand that we, again, use an electronic screen for most of these experiences, which means when we put it through, it spits out a report based on the categories you list and the number of hours. So oftentimes I will see somebody who maybe shadowed six different people and they list them as six different shadowing experiences. Well, that's great. You're trying to get to 15. Okay, but it's maybe like eight hours, four hours, one time. In a screen as clinical experience, that's going to come out on the low metric. If you put those experiences together and say unpaid shadowing, you list the different areas, you maybe did it over three years and you've got a hundred hours, that looks a lot better than one day and eight hours. So it's not only how you list them, what you list them, but how you group them. That's part of how we work with you. So let's break it down. I break it down into five categories, and we're going to talk about those. They are your academic experiences that are outside of your GPA and your test score. It is um, clinical experiences, your exposure, your understanding of your career field, service, leadership, and social. Social is not your dating schedule. I hope that's really good for you guys all, but we're going to talk about what's in there. So the first is when we're talking about academic, we break it into other categories. Research. Everybody talks about research, but it's not just about doing research. Generally, we want you to have done research to gain an appreciation of what research is all about. Any of you guys have done it. I know when I did my first research experience, I was like, hot dog, I'm going to get in the lab, I'm going to mix some potions, I'm going to be disgusting. I'm going to be all that in a bag of chips, and that is not what research is about. It is long, hard mistakes, failures, a lot of time that is just like beating your head against a wall. We want you to understand what the research process is about. Ideally, to be significant, it needs to be a minimum of a semester, ideally at least a year. It is not an end-all, be-all. No research does not mean you're not going to get in. However, if you aspire to go to a research-heavy school, if you're looking at places like Hopkins, Duke, et cetera, that are very, very research-oriented, then you will probably definitely have to have research. If you're not looking at one of those schools, then you may want to look at that's not the end all. What do you have in other categories? Teaching assistant or tutoring, be it independent tutoring, paid, working as a TA, working as an undergrad assistant. This is not important just because you did it, but to learn how to explain complicated information to people who don't necessarily understand it, skills that will be very important as a future physician. So we're going to get critical thinking skills demonstrated through research, teaching and tutoring, same thing, explaining, understanding complicated information. Study abroad, that does, just, does not mean just a formal study abroad. We're also talking about, have you done medical mission trips? Have you done international mission trips? What about your personal heritage? Are you maybe from first or second generation that have come to our country? Have you traveled extensively and gained exposure to other cultures? Or have you maybe worked in situations to give you, give you cultural appreciation? So it's not as much about the time you log away. It's about, do I understand what different cultures are about? Do I understand what people are about? I remember when I st first started working for WHO and I spent time in Ghana and Zimbabwe. I still have an office in Haiti. And when I went to Haiti, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to go work with the poor Haitian people. And I got to Haiti and they have taught me so much about me personally, um, about endurance, about the, the quality of life, about how they, they cook and the appreciation of life. Every night when the family would get together, we shared bravos and exchanges where everybody praised each other. It's learning about different cultures, food, lifestyle, and also the things that people face. So that's where that all comes important. The other thing is you don't want to approach your application just like you're checking off a bunch of stuff. You need to approach it about, is this different? Is this unique? Does it stand out? Use your time wisely. And if you don't have these things, then maybe think about going back and getting more. Other things like honor society, scholarship programs, honor programs all fit into this category. Another academic area Think about foreign language. Being fluent or speaking multiple languages is always an asset. Clinical experiences. So when we're talking about this, many people need to understand 
Diversity is more important than total hours. As a general rule, we like to see shadowing exposure in at least three to five different disciplines. Ideally, one of them must be primary care because there is such a push for that. Look for opportunities to do a medical mission trip, volunteering in a hospital ER. Not And everybody volunteers in a hospital. That's for service. Oftentimes, you can split those hours. Uh, but reach out. I mean, reach out to your personal physician. Do cold calling. Get experience as a CNA or a volunteer um, MA. Volunteer at a local indigent care clinic. Find different ways to gain that experience. You shoot for a minimum of three to five areas of at least 100 hours total. We are looking to see, have you tested the waters of what you're interested in? I get people all the time who are like, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon because I'm a football player. Well, that's great. But have you done orthopedic surgery? I know you're interested in sports, but have you actually worked in the areas? Medical school is where you will learn and decide about the career path you want to go into. What we need to figure out now is, have you really gained an understanding of what medicine is even all about? Again, aim for at least 100 hours of clinical exposure, shadowing in three to five different areas, making sure that you hit primary care. Paid clinical, big, big plus. We want to see that you have rolled up your sleeves and got in, gotten in there. Becoming a scribe, using a gap year to work as a full-time medical scribe or a CNA or an MA, or getting your EMTB certification. As a scribe, you have to actually look at the diagnosis, follow it down, write it down. As a CNA, you really get more exposure to going through that whole medical process. And also learning how to interact with not just the patient, but the patient families, understanding what's going on outside the walls of what you see. Service. I cannot emphasize this enough. I want you guys to think about service from a perspective of what you do in college, what you do out in your community, maybe what you do in your church. We generally think of service as looking for long-term service experiences. That means a minimum of six months done on a regular basis for at least 50 total hours. And look for the uniqueness of it. Um, I get people all the time who are writing about their services experiences and it says, I did this and I did that. We are looking for an appearance of putting yourself outside your comfort zone, things you did collaboratively. And the most important thing about service is how you changed through the service that you did. Um, one of my current students, so it's understanding those who you are serving, how you impact a change in a person's life. How do you show a selflessness that you truly took an initiative in doing something and looking at areas where you can volunteer. So a perfect example is one of my students got involved in Meals on Wheels. And he, again, he was just trying to add something into his overall dossier. And what he said was he had no idea the people he was serving and what was going on in his life. And he talked about taking meals to the elderly and seeing the smiles light up on their face, not with the meal that they were getting, but just the interaction with another human being. Oftentimes these people are shut-ins. They may never have conversation. They've, they've lost many people in their lives. Maybe they don't get visitors. And he talked about how it always tugged at his heart when he had to leave because he knew that they wanted him to stay longer, but they were always so appreciative. Service is about how you change through the service you do. And you need to be able to radiate that in your personal statement. You need to be able to radiate that through your experiences and subsequently in your interviews. And you do that by going through that course. So thinking about becoming a, a big brother or a big sister, I will tell you, um, my little has changed my life in ways that I can't even explain. I mean, I look at the things she does and her fortitude, her stamina, the stuff she's faced in 11 years of her life blows me away. Working with hospice, being with someone at the end of their life, appreciating what that means. Leadership experiences, very critical, because as a future leader, you're going to be the leader of your practice. And we want to see, A, have you learned from your mistakes? Can you inspire other people to follow you? But can you also make them feel like they are a part of your team? And I talk about this all the time. In your future practice, everybody that you hire will be depending on you for their, their future salaries. Okay, so that's important. Okay, 
but they are an integral part of your team. If your billing office can't appropriately submit billing and take accounts payable and accounts receivable, your practice is going to close. If your front desk person cops an attitude and somebody walks in and it's like, what are you here for today? That attitude is going to translate into your practice and that's going to reflect on your practice. So it's about, can you inspire everybody to fill a part of the team and want to work together for a common experience? Now, people often get really tied down in, you know, I had to be president of this club or pre look, we don't care if you're president of the country or the Mickey Mouse club. And it doesn't have to be an official title. Maybe you wrote a manual. Maybe you ser served as um, kind of the lead person for something. Maybe you developed a program. All of those can be leadership experiences. So I challenge you to think outside the box. How do you demonstrate management skills? Do you engender trust in others? Good leaders inspire those that they lead. And can you take the reins in bad situations? These will be come up time after time after time in secondaries. Start thinking about times you've faced a challenge, a time you failed. And please, please try to think of something other than I struggled in a class, if I read those things one more time. And how do you create an effective team? Last but not least are social experiences. I get a lot of people when I ask, what do you do for fun? And they're like, uh, I study. You are going to be working with a variety of people. We want to know two things when we're looking at your application. One, do you have an outlet? Medical school and a medical career are very stressful. So do you have things that you do that are an outlet? I am a huge yogi. And I can tell you, if I don't get in my morning yoga and my meditation, I am one grumpy bear. I am also a runner. Um, I, I am big into saltwater and fly fishing. I've got a big saltwater aquarium back here in the back. I don't fish in my aquarium. But do you have outlets that you can do in your house and outside of your house. The other thing is what type of interest do you have? Because we're wanting to know, can you connect with your patients? So what are your outside interests? So we're looking that you're more than just one dimensional. When we're interviewing you and looking at your application, we're looking at how will you fit into our class and the career in the future. So are you involved in clubs, fraternities, sororities, honor societies? Oftentimes people go, I don't want to talk about my fraternity or sorority. Well, we don't want to hear about your beer, booze, and times, but we do want to know about living with groups of other people, getting along, managing those things. They can actually be very beneficial. Expanding your network. Can you communicate with people who are not just you? This is another reason for taking a gap year. So often you guys are like hamsters on a treadmill. I got to get through college. I got to get through. I got to get through med school. It's going to take so much time. It is a year of time to the rest of your career. Think about getting outside of just academia and learning about what it's like to work a job, what it's like to potentially lose your job or face people who, who have to overcome other stresses in their life, sick, sick children, spouses, issues in their own personal life. So many college students have no concept of life outside of that. Building a support system. Are you going to have something when time gets tough? And last, personal interest outside of medicine, like we've already talked about. What does it take to make a good personal statement? So as we generally say, your personal statement should be thought of as five to six paragraphs. Think about it like a good book that you want to read. There needs to be a catch at the beginning, something that's going to catch my attention to intro me to the other paragraphs. There need to be three to five paragraphs that kind of throw, flow in a theme. Ideally, there should be some discussion of your service and some discussion of um, your clinical experience. You want to avoid cliches and things. If I hear one more time, I want to be a doctor because I want to help. I want to serve. I really like science. My nana died. I want to make a difference in the world. I know those are all great lofty things, but we tune it out because we hear it over and over again. Or I really want to be a doctor. I'm really empathetic. I'm really caring. We know you want to be a doctor. That's why you're applying. You should not have to tell me that you're caring and compassionate. It should come through in the story that you tell. So catch my attention. Give me three to five paragraphs. And in your final paragraph, reflect back and give a challenge going forward. 
Personal statement development starts now. Do not wait till you finish classes in April and May. I get students who have been going, I want to sign up to get help from your admissions counseling, but I want to wait till I get ready to apply. Do you sign up for MCAT prep the day before you start to take your MCAT? No. You want to spend six months working on it minimum. It's the same thing with your application. So why do you want to be a doctor? What makes you unique among other candidates? Avoid the cliches, please avoid the cliches, and make admissions committees want to read your statement and to read more. All right, what about those secondary applications? We've already said expect to get them from 85% of the schools that you apply to because most of them are automatically generated. I can tell you oftentimes they go unopened and unread, but there is no way for you to know that. So be realistic. I get people all the time who go, I applied to 40 schools, but I got overwhelmed. It got too expensive. Do the math, people. It's an expensive process. So when you apply, think about if I get a secondary, if I get an interview, the cost of travel, the time, the time out of your, you want to maximize your chances, but you also need to be realistic. I have a student right now who would not listen to me. I, I knew he was going to be a strong candidate. I encouraged him to apply to 15 to 20 schools. He applied to 40 schools. He has 35 interviews. Rarely ever happens. And he is dying. Okay, so secondary applications, most schools will automatically send them. You need to complete them ideally within two to three weeks. Make sure to check to see if there is a deadline, but two to three weeks is our rule of thumb. You want to start pre-writing additional writing samples immediately after submitting. We do keep a listing of last year's essays. They may not be the same, but at least you can start building some core essays that you can revise between schools, which by the way, if you copy and paste between secondary applications, please make sure to check and recheck. I don't know how many times if you're maybe reviewing, I'm, you're reviewing at Virginia Commonwealth and I hear how much you really want to go to Wake Forest because you did not check when you copied and pasted. All right, be careful when you copy and paste between applications. Interviews, when we are talking about interviews, it is your chance, chance to dress to impress. And I need you guys to understand people get so fixated on giving their big speech and you forget it's about the way you look, it's about the way you present yourself, and it's about making your strength stand out. I want you to think about your interview as being like watching that commercial you see over and over and over again. You want your outfit to be polished, but unique. We talk a lot about how to dress in my, and um, my interview, um, my former webinars are online. If you want to see like my interview tips, my secondary, et cetera, interview um, webinars, but you want to be dressed uniquely. That is professionally. So like when we talk about with guys, all guys wear a dark suit and a red and black tie and a white shirt. So you all look like little penguins standing out there in front of us and there's nothing about you that is memorable. You need to find a power tie with a, uh, with a pastel or some type of matched shirt for women. You need to find the right shell that goes underneath your shirt. Avoid collared shirts because those collars are flying all over the place. You want to make sure that you are presentable. When you talk in your interview, you want to be interactive. I cardinal mistake talking at me instead of talking with me. We get it over and over and over again. And people say the same old thing. So why do you want to go into medicine? I want to help and serve. And I really like science. And my grandma died. Yeah, I, I quit listening after that. Another big mistake. People, I will say, um, if there was only one spot left in our medical class, why should I give it to you? If you repeat my question back right back to me. I've probably already tuned you out. There are so many tricks of the trade about interviewing. Those are part of the tips that we need to share with you to help you make you stand out. And the number one way you do that is you know what your strengths are and whatever question you get asked, you highlight one of your strengths. Because typically we won't look at your application at least in, in terms of committee probably two to three weeks after you interview. Osteopathic is a little bit sooner, but when we open that application up after I've interviewed probably 40 other people since you've been in my office and I've heard the same thing, when I open your application up, I need to go, that's the person I talked to about scuba diving, or that's the person who had that really unique experience in Honduras, something that makes you memorable. 
So interviews, look professional. Minute you walk through the doors when it goes, and it goes to eye contact, it goes to tone of voice, it goes to presentation. Make yourself memorable, all right? Be prepared for any and all questions. Be prepared and know how to highlight your unique selling points. Review your application, research the medical school, and please do not ever ask me a question that is clearly stated on our website, just ask a question. All right, and don't forget to send thank you notes and letters of intent and continued interest. They are not gonna be game changers. I have never gotten a thank you note or a letter of intent where I went, oh, hot dog, I gotta go get that person and accept them. But you want to keep yourself memorable with the people that you interviewed with. Gap years is the last thing I wanna talk to you guys about before I go on to some other stuff. I cannot recommend enough. Right now, if you're applying next year, you need to sit down and start thinking about your 15 experiences. Think about the stuff that I told you today and go, do I hit all of these and what am I missing? If I'm missing something, give yourself a fighting chance and think about taking an additional year to strengthen your application. It can help more more than you can ever imagine. I've never had anyone take a gap year who did not come back to me and say, this is the best thing I ever did, except the people who kind of sat on their butts. I mean, you can travel, backpack Europe, get a job, get exposure and volunteering, all of those things you can make you be more competitive when you go to the pros. Now, I wanna ask you guys um, one more um, question. So um, our job is to help you figure out how to get in. TPR, we got that whole bag of tricks. I mean, we can cover it from anything. If you're struggling with a class, we've got our tutor.com people um, to help you boost your with um, on-demand tutoring 24 seven, anytime you need it. Obviously, you know, we are the bomb diggity in test prep and we can do it self-paced. You can do it live online. You can do it in person, whatever you need. And then medical admissions. I mean, we've got a whole suite of things from just helping to your primary, to helping with your comprehensive packages, to our our premier counseling, which allows you to work directly with me one-on-one -on -one throughout your entire application process. Um, so real quickly, I'm going to open it up for some Q&A for you guys, although I'm not Wherever my arrow has disappeared to, I'm not sure I can launch the other poll. Um, can I turn it back over to you, Joanna? Can you launch the poll for me? Um, is that possible? Possibly. Let me see. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, I, by golly, I think it's back. There we go. <laughs> hey, can any of you guys, if you are interested in getting more information about where you currently stand in terms of your application, or if you would like advice on how to prep for the MCAT or some more interest about our tutor.com stuff, just let me know and we'll be happy to reach out to you and give you some feedback. Um, just sort of what, what all it's all about and really more to kind of help you understand where you are right now. So if you have any interest in that, just let us know and we'll be in touch. All right, how about Q&A time? Anybody got some questions for me? Yeah, I have a first question I see um, is, what if you haven't already taken the MCAT and are planning to take it in March or April? Okay, so that's great because that's the perfect timing. Um, I'm, hopefully you're prepping for it, you know, be watching where your scores are. March or April, first thing is, test dates are already open and a lot of those spots are filled. So if you haven't already registered, you need to get registered now. You can always change your date, but you wanna get a spot. Um, like I said, if you're gonna take it in March or April, that's ideal because you can be putting your whole application together. You can even open your AMCAS application and be inputting all that information, which is great. And even if you don't submit this year, at least you've got that information. Okay, so you want to take March or April that allows you to get your test score back somewhere in May before you would have to submit your application. Again, I encourage you to test, wait 48 hours, and then schedule a retest, ideally sometime the end of June, no later than the 1st of July, so that they can have a screening test score. And if you submit and you're not happy with your score, at least schools will know you plan to retake or you've got a valid score before you know. So for instance, if I get somebody who maybe tests the first time in March or April, and let's say they get a pretty lower sub 500 score, none of what any of us want, but I will tell you, I tested under the old MCAT. I had a 4.0 GPA. I had over 5,000 hours of clinical experience. 
I didn't know you were supposed to study for the MCAT because back in the day when dinosaurs walked the earth, they didn't tell us we were supposed to study. And I got a 24 on my first MCAT, which meant I was going pretty much nowhere. That was the equivalent of like, you know, the, the current, like a 498. Um, I literally went to the dean at Chapel Hill and he said, so what else do you want to do with your life? And I was like, crap, I'm not getting in. And then I went back and I studied and I studied and I retook and I got a 38, which is the equivalent of like getting a, five, a 523, 524 now. So it really totally switched the pendulum. But for me, it was like, ooh, I needed to prepare and retest. If your score is where you might get screened out at MD programs and you're not considering a DO program, then you may want to do what I said and go ahead and submit to just your one reach school and do that retest in June or July before you add all of your additional schools because you don't want to burn that reapplicant status if you don't get your MCAT where you want it to be this year. And it's not the end of the world. You're like, and trust me, I felt it. I was right there. I was like, my world is over. I'm never going to be a doctor. But just pace yourself and wait for the time. Hopefully that answered your question. Do you have any more? Yes, we do have more questions. I'll just keep going down the list. Um, how far back should you go with your experiences? Like, should you focus on college only? Or if you had some leadership experience in high school? That's an excellent question. Yeah, um, colleges, um, medical schools do not want to see anything prior to college. There are exceptions to those rules. So first of all, experiences should be college forward. Um, another point, and we do see this sometimes, sometimes people have taken gap years and their service experiences, they may have had a lot of service, but nothing else in like the past two to three years. We also want to see continued service. Like if you take that gap year, if you're coming back, you need to focus on it. The exceptions of things before college are things that you did in high school that continued on through college. You can put a high school start date in through college and then you can loop them over. But if it's high school, only you should avoid it the exception is um things like um eagle scout and gold award for girl scout and boy scout you can use those for leadership but outside of that general rule you need to avoid stuff from high school next question can you start working on an application for the next application cycle now no, you can't. And I've actually had some people who have really, really made this mistake. And thank you so much. That's an excellent question. Um, you could get into the application system now, but if you started working on that, you would actually be working in the 2018-2019 application cycle. On May 31st, I'm oh, sorry, on April 30, 30th, we will close out the old AMCAS application and then open the new one. And that will be the new one. So if you start start inputting stuff into that, it will be in the old application cycle, not the new one. And I've had a couple of people really, really mess that up because they thought they were getting a jump start on it. Um, but we have, we have like templates of, you know, kind of what you're looking at. So, you know, so like for AMCAS, you've got 5,300 characters. You can start working on those parameters. If you're looking at your experiences, you know, you've got 700 characters, you've got 1,325 characters for your 15 experiences and your three most meaningful. So you can start working to try to carve out those experiences in the correct format. Next question. If um, if someone was taking the MCAT in May, uh -huh. when would you recommend signing up for a prep course, an MCAT prep course? Um, so pacing yourself, depending upon what you would do, if you're not in a prep course now, there are a couple of options if you're signing up for a course. So there are what we call our winter boot camps, which are over your winter breaks. Some people want to do a really intensive class and then use their whole spring to work on their practice test and their additional information. Others want to sign up for the spring test that preps them for spring testing, which generally runs January to 
March or April, depending upon what your schedule is, like which of the live online courses that you select. That would prep you for an April class. The problem with that is this sort of what we talked about. You need to be dedicated enough to not only be going through the content, but really working through training on those practice tests to make sure that you complete enough practice tests, not just the content. Um, if you cannot get that prep in until later, again, this is an important time where you go, I'm not quite ready. Do I want to take a gap year and maybe prep in the first part of May and then use the whole rest of the summer to test in August with the plan that I'm going to test in August. If I'm not there, I'm going to retest in January or March of the next year and I will be applying during my gap year. So it's really trading off, figuring out where the best timing is. And that's where we can really help you out with a lot of that advice. Hope that helped. Do you have another question? Um, yes. Um, what is your favorite curveball interview question? <laughs> oh my goodness, we have a lot of those. Um, it's been interesting to ask the questions that that people look like deer in a headlight. Um, it's it's really funny, and you definitely want to be prepared for them. We actually have a list of like my hundred top favorite questions or whatever, um, and it's it's amazing the things that stump people up. I mean, you're always prepared with why this school, why you want to be a physician. I find that the ethics questions people struggle with a lot. Um, it's always funny to me because I'll say, you know got a patient. She comes into your office. She's a 14 year old girl. She comes in with her mom and her mom leaves the room. And while her mom leaves the room, she tells you that she would like for you to prescribe birth control for her, but she doesn't want you to tell her mother. Um, what, what, how would you handle that? And without fail, nine times out of 10, people will go, well, I guess the first thing I'd want to do is figure out why she wants birth control. Uh, I think that's a pretty straightforward answer already. And they take the approach of going, they go directly for the thing at hand versus thinking outside of it. And so, for example, I always tell them, or, or they go, well, I've got to figure out if it's legal in my state or not. They go very pragmatic rather than we're asking you those questions to think about your thought process. And do you think past the patient to the person? And so my first step will be, I mean, obviously, the reason she's seeking birth control is more than likely she's already sexually active, but or is she thinking about becoming sexually active? But my other step as a physician is to address, is she doing this because she's already got fear? Is she being pressured? Is somebody putting her? So you need to address not just the A to B, but the A, B, C, and D. And so we're looking for that thought process. Another funny one that I often get is I will say, if you could have dinner with anybody, living or dead, who would it be? And I mean, I'm amazed at how many people you would have thought that I just asked them to donate a kidney because it's just like, uh, and so I think generally it's more ethics questions or more just questions of like looking to feel more depth of you. People are really good about tell me about your best service or your best leadership or sometime you overcame something or whatever. But the questions that are more on the fringes, they seem to really struggle with. Um, I did, I will tell you, and I think I've talked about this. I had an interview in my interview at Chapel Hill where we were like grooving in our interview and the dean stopped and he goes, hold on a second. And he pulled out a picture and he laid it down on the table. And it was two people standing on a dock fishing with some birds in the air. And he goes, what do you see in this picture? And I was like, oh my. And it was your first approach was trying to name everything in it. And instead I looked at him and I said, you know, the truth of this is you're going to ask this to 10 people and we're all going to note these key things in the picture, but everybody's going to look at it from a little different perspective and none of them are really wrong. It's just like medicine. There are key things you need to do to treat somebody, but you can approach it in so many different ways. And he looked at me and he went, finally, somebody answered that correctly. And I was like, phew. So um, we are over time now. Um, I hope if any of you guys have questions that we did not get to, we'll try to get back to you guys and get you those back by email or posting or whatever. But I want to thank you guys so much for your time. We will be giving you December off, but make sure to join me in January because I am actually going to be talking about why people with good GPAs and good MCAT scores 
get denied from med school. And when we said 60% of people don't get in, of the 60% who don't get in, about 50% of those have great GPAs and great MCATs, just like my reapplicants this year, and they were denied. Why? I'm gonna help fill you in on that. Hope you guys have a good day. Thanks for sticking with me.